Come and join us as we discover Selworthy of the 1850s. Our visit was inspired by Marianne Selina Archard Thompson. Marianne tells us we went to Selworthy for six months and stayed there for six years. Selworthy held such a special memory for Marianne that she published a small book containing her memories of the people she knew and grew up with. Marianne arrived with her parents and older brother in the autumn of 1850. My father undertook the charge of Selworthy as the old rector, Mr Stevenson, was too old and unable to do any work. Marion's mother produced a number of detailed sketches of the village as it was then. We are here for the first time to explore and discover Selworthy with the help of Marion's small book. How will it have changed in the 170 years? Will we be able to find the places she talks about? Hey? This is one of the pictures. Yeah, there's a grave here, isn't there? This is the... Wait, is this the boy's grave? Yeah. Sadly, within six months of arriving at Selworthy, Marianne's older brother, by two years, rests close to the old cross in that loveliest of churchyards. We start by looking for Charlie's grave. Our dear Charlie was six, a beautiful, handsome boy, and very forward in all ways. As a child, I always thought looking towards Dunkery from the cross was like a peep into heaven. Dunkery Beacon can be seen in the wild expanse of moorland opposite Selworthy. It is the highest point on Exmoor at 520 metres or 1,700 feet. Marion tells us that these two lithographs were taken from her mother's sketchbook from that time. The cross and graves are still very recognisable 170 years later. So she would have seen the fire from here, would you? Yes. Can you see where the building was? You see the space. This is a hotel now. It's a hotel now? Yeah. It was rebuilt. On the Saturday towards the end of August 1851, just six months after the loss of our Charlie, my mother was sketching our Charlie's grave in the churchyard when Sir Thomas Ackland's home, a long, low, thatched house or cottage, as I believe Sir Thomas liked to call it, burnt down. It was very dry weather, water was scarce and the private fire engine would not work. One of the people Marion mentions in her small Selworthy book is Mr. Birmingham, Sir Thomas Atkins' bailiff or steward. We discover him in the churchyard. Robert Birmingham. He was, he was, he was no, Mr. Birmingham, also known as Mr. Robert. Okay. He was the factor. Mm. And his wife on the on the right here. Yeah. Or oh, is his daughter, aged 18 years. We take the opportunity to go into Selworthy Church. The church was the reason Marion and her parents were in Selworthy. She tells us the Yorkshire climate disagreed so much with my father that he was obliged to be away from his parish every winter and spring. My father took charge of Selworthy as the old rector, Mr Stevenson, being quite unable to do any work. Sir Thomas Ackland had been Mr Stevenson's pupil. As a child I can still remember the respectful affection Sir Thomas greeted his old tutor. My dear old friend, Sir Thomas owned most of the property in the valley and I should think all Selworthy too. Yeah, he's not mentioned, because I guess he wasn't the rector. Because it was a temporary position, wasn't it? He was helping him. He was right? covering for the, you know, Stevenson wasn't capable of it. Yeah. The old rector, Mr Stevenson, was almost entirely confined to his house. 
he was always to be found sitting in his library. My father used to call upon him regularly, every day except Sunday, after our lunch or early dinner. My mother used to go and see whether the old man wanted anything when my father was away. I used to go sometimes, and Mr. Stevenson was very kind to me. He used to cross-question me about my lessons, especially about my sums. I always loved Selworthy Church from the days when I used to study the carved bosses in the roof, the only things I could see from the old-fashioned high square pew. Lovely country was a great blessing to me. I learnt at Selworthy to care for all things beautiful. Does it look like that is current. Oh, it does look a bit sort of. I don't know. Yeah. That is really okay. big, isn't it? It's rather nice, isn't it? That's that thatch is so nice. <laughs> we head off to find the green. Marion writes, To me all the recollections of Selworthy are so interesting that I hardly know what to write about. Jenny Sage lived at the top of the green. This was Jenny's house. Yeah. Marion says, her spinning wheel was an endless interest to me. I think it was almost the only spinning wheel still used in the parish. Jenny hated the school that Lady Ackland had started for the old people on the green. My mother used to say she was just like a child. If she could read a wrong word, she did it. After spelling painfully the letters S, I N, she would burst out in a triumphant tone, Righteousness! My mother thought she did it sometimes on purpose to make a diversion. Lady Ackland had the habit of giving the elderly ladies scarlet coats at one time. The old women used to show how superior in colour and material the old cloaks they had all their lives were to the modern ones. On Sunday, the elderly women, in their scarlet cloaks, would slowly wend their way up to the church. Marion continues, The dear old people who live on Selworthy Green deserve to be remembered. Nanny Down, she lived to be considerably over 90, was a special friend of mine. She gave me a, a little plate which now stands on my chimney piece and a curious shaped stone she called a hard stone. I think her husband had picked up it up a long time ago. Nanny Dan had learnt to read in her old age and was proud of the accomplishment. Ivy's cottage. This was, uh, let me see, Nanny Downs. Nanny Downs? And there's Nanny Down in the picture. Photograph. When she was about 90 or something. All right. I found it on the internet. Oh, fantastic. She often begged her visitors to hear her read, but she would only read two chapters, her favourite chapter, she called them. One was the chapter of St John's Gospel, and the other was the chapter of the first epistle of St John. My mother always thought she knew them by heart, dear old nanny. My nurse and I used to pick up sticks taken to her for her fire. Uh, nanny always sang her Christmas hymn. She told us that during her married life, she, was, she always sang this hymn early on Christmas morning to her Jerry. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, David. Marion wrote, Nanny used to often talk about her Jerry. I believe she thought he still visited her. When she was getting very old and feeble, Sir Thomas Ackland was most anxious that someone should be with her at night and wanted another old lady to live with her. Nanny firmly refused. She never had had anyone but her Jerry, and she never would. She was allowed to have her own way. Opposite Nanny Down's house was Mary Eames, the Lady Abbess, Sir Thomas used to call her. She would run up pretty often to see that Nanny was all right. In those days, Mary Eames was much younger than the rest of the inhabitants of the Green. She was specially chosen that she might look after the old people and nurse them if necessary. She had an invalid husband, a carpenter by trade, a very nice man who was a great sufferer. I always say that William Eames first gave me an interest in missions by lending me to read, or rather 
for my nurse to read to me a little old-fashioned square book, The History of a Slave Boy, by Samuel Crowther. Mary Weems was still here to greet me in 1900 in my last visit with Kate Hardcastle. On my birthday, the old people had tea all together under the walnut tree on the green. The tea was started quite by chance. I was in Mary Eames' cottage with my nurse a day or two before my sixth birthday and told Mary I should be six on such a day at the 21st of May. Nanny Down was sitting there and Mary Eames turned to her and said, Then you and I shall have a cup of tea together and keep Missy birthday. I said, Oh! You should all have tea together. The idea was quickly taken up, and when my mother found that a tea on the green under the walnut tree was to be held on my birthday, she had a big cake made and sent it up with some tea and sugar. The old people always managed this tea. We were only invited guests. My birthday has never been so honoured since. The teas were kept for a long time after we left till, as Mary Eames said, there was none of the old people left to come to them. This looks like a very old thing, isn't it? Yeah. Mr Stevenson was very liberal and kind-hearted. He always gave something to all those who came to the rectory, and it always paid the messengers. Every year a tithe dinner was held at the rectory. Of course, Mr Stevenson did not dine with the tithe payers himself, but my father was always present. Yeah. Maybe stop model. What exactly is a tithe, and what exactly is a tithe dinner? So I had to Google it, and Google told me tithe comes from the old English meaning tenth, a custom dating back to the Old Testament times, whereby lay people contributed a tenth of their income for religious purposes. The tithe was used to support the clergy, maintain churches, assist the poor. And in England, the tithe rent charges were abolished in 1936. So I presume the dinner was some form of paying back or recognising the payments from the congregation. But that is my interpretation. I couldn't find anything specifically about tithe dinners. Marion continues, The day after the dinner, some of the remains, cold beef, both roast and boiled, some plum pudding used to be sent to us, and I believe to many other houses also. I should think everything was done in the old-fashioned style. One tithe dinner day I was sent to the rectory on an errand with my nurse. It was a sight worth seeing, one great joint roasting before the big kitchen fire, and in a great back kitchen another roast joint was roasting, the spit being turned by the old basket maker. That's the old rectory. That's where Mr. Stevenson, oh. the parson, lived. It must have been quite a celebration. I couldn't find anywhere that would tell me when tithe dinners would be held. The information on the internet was very scant with regard to tithe dinners and timings, etc. One of our next tasks was to try and find the cottage that Marion lived with her parents. She left us some clues. First was one of her mother's sketches, and adding, the little cottage still stands in all its loveliness on the left side of the lane. And let's see if there's anything else you could help us with before. Or the church again. Oh, I think nice, the rest there. Nice idea, is there? Yeah, we, it, it, yeah. Yeah. Marion tells us how she remembers travelling from Minehead by coach. It was quite dark when we reached Selworthy. I can still see my mother running down this path, it must be this path in front of us, to meet us. Jane, our Yorkshire cook, with her quaint corkscrew curls, with a lantern, and Mary Eames, dear old Mary Eames, from the green. Except for myself, the last survivor, I believe, of that group, now I am the only one left. The cottage has rather improved since our day, but the two grand arbutus trees on each side of the little path are gone.
before we set off to find the water mill and school that Marion talks about, I want to cover a short anecdote to do with the farm. I think this is the farm, which we found fascinating as it appears to contain many old buildings. I can imagine these farm buildings being full of activity at that time, with horses and animals, and the yard here would not, of course, be covered in grass. Marion tells us that every year an SPG deputation came to Selworthy and a missionary meeting was held at Elephant School. I had to have a look and try and work out what SPG was because obviously she didn't feel it necessary to enlarge on it. And Google tells me it's for the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. It's not a term that we recognise today in everyday conversation. 1850 was before the Europeans went to Africa to try and improve the standard of living out there. And the missionaries took a leading role. And Livingston, of course, was travelling through Africa. And he was trying to promote more people to be missionaries. Anyway, she goes on to say, The schoolroom was about a mile from our cottage. We always had to entertain the deputation. Late one autumn afternoon, a gentleman arrived at the cottage. He began to ask about the meeting, and when told the school was a mile off, he explained in an injured tone, I can't walk. I never walk. It's quite impossible. What was to be done? It was too late to send into Minehead for a fly. The rector had no carriage, and of course the curate had not. In fact, nobody in the place even possessed the trap. My father in despair sent to consult the farmer, and the message came back that the horses were all out, but if one came in from the ploughing time, they would send it up. I believe the horse did arrive, and mounted on the plough horse, the grand gentleman rode down to the school. And of course, my mother walked. I do not think the gentleman made a favourable impression. He seemed quite to expect that the country clergy kept horses and carriages. I do not think he had been a missionary. Just walking through these buildings, I can just feel the atmosphere of times past. Yeah, it was lovely to be here. So how far is it to Ellsbury? Eh? One mile. One mile. The Missionary Society man came. He arrived at the house, at the yeah. cottage, and yeah. he, he was having a meeting in Alford, and he refused to walk the one mile. Oh. They had to get the farmer to send his horse. <laughs> so this is the route is the horse would have taken. Yeah. As we walk the one mile to Aylesford, we know Marion as her mother would not have been unfamiliar with this route. Her mother certainly walked to the school at the same time as the missionary gentleman sat on the plough horse. Marion says, I must not forget Captain, my donkey. Mrs Hackney, the old people called him. He was a capital donkey, very sure-footed and full of spirit. I rode everywhere on him and down the zigzags and steps and along the narrow paths. Captain had only one bad habit. He would open almost any gate and get through any fence. One Sunday morning at Brimpton, Dandy, the pony, the two cows and Captain were all missing. They were found at last in a neighbour's orchard. Captain that day had opened at least three gates. Quite as bad as a Christian, said the old gardener Samson Dade. One day at Selworthy, the farmer's wife came to complain of Captain, carrying two dead ducklings. Tired of his orchard, he jumped over a wall into the farmyard, alighting in the middle of a brood of ducklings. The farmer's wife said she would not have minded, only it was so wanton of him. Poor Captain, he could not see over the wall. We did not think him very guilty, but we had to pay for the ducks. The time Marion writes about is the early 1850s. Conflict has never been far away in Europe. Marion says, We were at Selworthy during the Crimean War. None of our relations were engaged in it, but my godmother's sister offered herself as a nurse. She did not go out with Miss Nightingale, but with another lady who took out a party of nurses for the sailors. Miss Vayside, my godmother, came to stay with us, she was getting a parcel ready to send out to her sister Gertrude. We all set to work to help. Hi, we're not. We're, we're going to Alfred in anyway. Alfred. Are we there now? Hi, Alfred. We are. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, 
My mother made a splendid housewife or needle book with needles of every size and description. Our servants also worked for the sailors. I was asked if I could not find a book to send out as the sailors liked being read to. After a great deal of thought, I chose the little squat Life of Columbus. I thought they would enjoy the book and the very quaint picture of Columbus in his ship. Our first task is to find Powell's Mill. We take the left turn here through a farmyard and some houses before reaching the mill. Let me continue with what Mayan told us it was like those days with the Crimean War. Some men from the parish were engaged in the war. Michael Chapman with his ship in the Baltic. Another man, a member of a very ne'er-do-well family, wrote, why well, I should think, got someone to write for him, a long letter which was sent round in triumph to be read. The only part I remember was a grand description of Constantinople, copied from the guidebook, some of the elders said. Mr Birmingham, Sir Thomas's bailiff or steward, came round one evening to collect money for the soldiers or their families. As he left the drawing room, he asked if he might go to the kitchen. I then found out what he was doing and begged to be allowed to add sixpence. Here we are. Oh, that's the little bridge, is it? Oh, the bridge is there. Where's oh. the mill room? There's yeah. the mill room. Oh, yeah. the that's the gate, the, the, the door. door. Yeah. And One, a... two, three windows, yeah? Is there yeah. A yeah. Bit, so. And what's that? That's the bridge. I think so. Maybe it's just hidden in the undergrowth, yeah. It is hard to describe the sheer magic of the day, not only finding the houses around Selworthy Green, as they were sketched by Marion's mother some 170 years later, but now to find Powell's Mill wow. virtually unchanged. We truly felt we were walking with Marion. Of the mill, Marion said, one very cold day, I remember being taken to Powell's Mill. The wheel was covered with a mass of icicles. I've never seen so many since in England. At Selworthy, they used to call the icicles conquer bells. One last look at Powell's Mill as we head back to the T-junction to walk the last bit of the route to Aylford. Let me continue with Marin's description of how the people of Selworthy helped the men in the Crimea. Both our servants gave sixpence. Sir Thomas sent Mr. Stevenson some specimens of preserved vegetables which had been prepared to send out to the soldiers, also soap in squares. I rather think we tried it. I believe that the preserved vegetables were quite a novelty. In time came the peace, and then the peace celebrations. Mrs. Birmingham came one day to see us in a great fuss. Sir Thomas had written to tell her husband to get up entertainment to celebrate it peace in the Holnicote grounds. The grandest peace celebration was at Dunster, where tables were placed in the street. We had a capital view from a window where our friend Mr Richards placed us. My mother always said that it was the most striking scene. The picturesque street, the old marketplace at one end, and at the other the castle looking down on the busy crowds. After dinner, everyone went to the park to see the games, dinner or supper at the Richards at Olcom, and drive home by starlight made this a great one for me. I think there were peace celebrations in most places. One village, Carhampton, I believe, felt much injured at not having had any entertainment and hoisted a black flag with poor village on it. Someone at last took pity on the place and gave them a tea. They then took down their black flag. Marion tells us about the blacksmith. Incredibly, there's a blacksmith here today. The doctor lives some six miles off, and I do not fancy the poor people had much attention paid to them. The blacksmith had a good many patients. He was always ready to pull out teeth and sometimes more difficult operations. One day my father met a man who looked very ill and showed him a terribly poisoned finger. My father begged him to go to the doctor at once. He saw the man a few days afterwards and asked about the finger. He was told it was all right now. He'd been to the blacksmith 
We chopped off the finger there and then. In addition to the blacksmiths, we wanted to see if we could find the school that Marion mentions. And this is the girls' entrance, I mean, maybe. All girls, but it might have been, you know, did they, they segregate the girls from the boys? Or? It was here at the school that the missionary meeting was held 170 years ago. Today, the school is an excellent museum that is well worth visiting in its own right. Could we find the classroom that Marion talks about? Marion says, sometimes you went to the school at Alford. I do not remember much about the learning. My great delight was the school mistress's chickens. Her hens sat, I hardly dare mention the fact in these days, in the school cupboards. I think there were two shelves, one for the slates and the other for the hens. At any rate, the chickens throve and ran about among the children. We must now head out of Alford to look for the walks that Marion mentions. Marion says, we must have had some lovely summers at Selworthy. Many a summer evening we used to go along the walks. Our favourite seat was in the middle walk. How we loved those walks. Even now I can find my way among them. I can remember the names of the various zigzags and paths. Upper, lower, middle, superior pride. The views were rather blocked by the growth of trees the last time I was at Selworthy in 1900. We longed for an axe to clear away some of the branches. Washington Hill. Marion tells us, all these years my father was trying to exchange Hotham in Yorkshire, his parish, a most troublesome business, she said. At last in 1856 he succeeded in effecting an exchange with the rectory at Brimpton. My father had to sacrifice a good deal of income to carry out the matter. He felt so strongly he had no business to keep a living where he was unable to reside. I'm sure it was great relief to my father and mother to have their future settled, but the leaving of Selworthy was a great grief to them both. The goodbyes were very hard work, but at last they were said, and on one cold day towards the end of January in 1857, we left our dear little cottage. Sir Thomas Ackland sent our goods to Brimpton in one of his wagons. John Stenner was in charge. At Christmas, Sir Thomas generally used to bring little remembrances to his friends. I was very proud of a pair of lined gloves he gave me. His parting present to me was a beautiful bound copy of Pilgrim's Progress. My name is written in it, and the words, In kind recollection of Selworthy and the little cottage, New Year's Day, 1857. At the bottom of the page these words are added, With my kind wishes, for the happiness of her own pilgrimage, Thomas Dyke Ackland. Before we go, who was Marion Thompson? Her father was Reverend George Archer Thompson, who was born in 1814 and died 90 years later in 1904. Her mother, who created the lovely sketches in this book, was Marion Janetta Rattray, the second daughter of Dr. Charles Rattray of Daventry. Marion and George had two children. Their son died when they were at Selworthy. Marion, the younger of the two, was born in 1846 and died unmarried in 1927. Marion was our grandfather, Lieutenant Colonel Rattray's first cousin. He was killed in Mesopotamia in 1917 during World War I. Marion left the greater part of her will in a trust for her cousin's children and grandchildren. We are Haldane Rattray's grandchildren. We've come on a journey of discovery, learning about Marion and her time at Selworthy. This small video is our tribute to Marion Selina Archer Thompson, our first cousin, twice removed. <laughs>